He'll speak up. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
It's a 360 camera. It, it automatically goes to whoever's talking. So it'll mostly go to him, but like if anybody calls or asks a question, it will show, it'll show the, like a the whole screen, like different segments. So it won't be like that the entire time. Uh, so don't worry about the pair, you know, y'all look fine. So I'm gonna turn it over to Skip and this is the first night of this. And we got three other nights. Yes, ma'am. Through the end of January. Same yes. time, same place. So, back out and we don't know what we're doing yet <laughs> we'll decide that towards the end of this program but, but uh yes, Ms. lisa and miss tiffany thank you for inviting me to do it <laughs> what we're going to do here and i'm not going to try not to we have any cages or anything but you're basically going to have a social studies lesson free care uh and we're not going to have tests so, uh, and, and this is very informal. Um, in 2008, uh, Ms. Scotty Nolan and Penny West and I, they asked us to do an, an updated history of Esther County. So tonight, 
where I'm going to start, I'm going to follow our little platform. This was in the book, and I do remember the sesquicentennial, which was in 1958. So right. I I wasn't here during 1808, though. <laughs> uh, but before we start, um, I, I want to mention a couple of things about what makes Estill County, not just Estill County, but this area, uh, unique. And when I start these talks, and even um, and, and some people don't want to believe this, and that's fine. But it was sometimes difficult. One of the hardest things to teach uh, elementary kids was latitude and longitude. And to explain why that we find uh, brachiopods on top of Barnes Mountain, mm -hmm. Kitten Ridge, and, and out on Pilot, and, and, and so forth. And they, they would bring in a, 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 a piece of something, and their eyes would be big, and they would say, Mr. Doss, I found a petrified wall fence. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, you didn't. It's a head of coral. And to try to explain to some of these youngsters, uh, you know, how the piece of coral got up on these mountains or down in the creek is, is very unique. But what I want us to, to take a look at here just very briefly, and I would tell them this, and it didn't really have much of an impact, but at one time, we were 10 degrees below the equator. Kentucky was right here in Esco County. So just to take a little, and, and if you look at this, when you say it, it's 10 degrees below the equator, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But when you get a globe out and look at it, now Irvin, where we're at right now, we're, we're 38 degrees above. So if you go 10 degrees below, we're right north of Lima, Peru. We were a warm, shallow sea. And this is when we were Pangea. We were one continent. So, and, and that comes, that's going to come in later when we start to talk about agates and so forth, but because, and we're not going to get into agates tonight, but we're, we're, we're going to in one of these four-part series. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, I, I have in my possession an old, Jack probably has this, it's the geology of Estill County, Kentucky. Have you ever seen this? I will get you a copy of it by Willard Rouse Gilson. Yeah. I'm sure the name is familiar to you. And this was printed in 1966. And when I go talk uh, to people about Estill County and their geologists, they talk about the Great Meander. Does anyone in here know what the Great Meander is? Well, I didn't either. But they're talking about what happened here in the, in the Kentucky River. And it's a, an abandoned meander. Now, what does it mean to meander? Wonder. To wander. And, and I, I've seen Mr. Tate here, um, who was assistant principal at the high school one time. And we sometimes refer to some of our students as water babies. Well, what does water do? It takes the path of least resistance, it meanders. And there would be a child that we were having trouble with getting to come to school and we never knew where they were gonna be. They would be at grandmothers, they'd be at mom and dad's. They took the path of least resistance. So they meandered. So this great Kentucky River meandered. Now Frankfort has two, but Estill County has the biggest one. And it's actually talked about here in this book. And it's referred to as the Pea Ridge Meander. And I have a topographical map here that I wanted to bring to show you the past part of it. Now, if you know where Station Camp Creek, it comes in the river up here. This river turned right here is, you see this white? That's low elevation. Part of it is over here. This is the Great Meander. It turned there to Fairground, went up Wiseman Town. This book says now Crooked Creek and Clear Creek drain this area. It actually went around. So when you're going down Wiseman Town Road, when you're going down 499, and you're looking over to the left, if you're going out, for Jimmy Nolan's, all those bottoms down there, that's an ancient river, baby. And it actually turned what there's probably some of you still know where Tom Boyd's junkyard was. 
Well, some of the, I have found some of the prettiest agates in Tom Bowie's junkyard. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you just this little story is I, a rock is laid in my backyard for 20 years. And I got to dig it in my closet and I found a can that said Tom Bowie's junkyard on it. And it was an agate that I had found. And I had tried to get three different people to cut it. And they said that rock's not worth cutting. It didn't pretty enough to cut, it's gonna come apart. Well, we have some young guys in our Aggie Club now, and they looked at it, one of them said, I'll cut it. So they put some epoxy mist in a vacuum and put that rock in there and it held together. And I had three necklaces made out of it and took and gave each one to each one of Tom Boyd's daughter for letting me hunt out there. And, and I will bring them when we talk about agates. I will I will bring that. But it went out around around Tom Bowens, down by the soccer field, and turned. And when you're coming down Drowning Creek Hill, all of those bottoms over there, if someone comes in in Esther County from my family and they don't know anything, they say, why aren't they buildings over there? <laughs> well, the reason they aren't buildings over there is because the water gets up. You know, it, it's and that is the old river bay. So it went all the way around and literally turned like you're going to West Oregon School and went back in. It almost closed itself off. And if you climb Sweet Lake Knob, which was part of my social studies, uh, Captain Hardy, he's a colonel now, let me take my classes up on top of Sweet Lake Knob. That's how I taught elevation. There, there's a benchmark on there. And when you look across it at, at P Ridge, it looks like someone filled a big giant bowl full of dirt and turned it upside down. This is P Ridge right here. <laughs> How P Ridge get its name? There's about two farms there that grew cow peas, <laughs> which is the forerunner to the soy bean. So that's how P Ridge got its name. Now, first people of Esther County. We're we'll moving back to the paleo times. And the way they define the paleo era is by a flute. And, I, and not an arrow, it was a spear point. Now you're talking, there was an ice age here. The glaciers were down near at Cincinnati, the Ohio River. Our flora and fauna, the fauna, the plants were much like Canada and Northern Michigan. There were the, the firs, uh, there was a, a, a beach. Um, it was just, it was totally different. And when you try to tell people, some people, that there was actually a mammoth in Esper County, they don't want to believe you. Well, how do we know the paleo people were here? In Esther County. Well, if you look in this magazine, the Central States, volume 87, January 2010, number one, and you go over here, page 32, this, this whole edition is on the paleo. And it says above right, and I will pass this around here, and, and we're going to when we finish, I'm going to leave this out. You can come up and, and, and we'll chat and do whatever. It says above right, a 3 and 11 16th inch clothes point found by Kendall Arthur in a hog lot at Fitchburg, Esther County, Kentucky. It is made of a beautiful striped paleo Carter Cave blend. A Carter, and Carter Cave blend is found all over the United States. And we know that it comes up near Grayson. We also have a type of, of we call it Depolite locally. It's green. It has a brown skin. Now, I did not find this quote in situ. This came out of the creek that I was not nagging in. And if you want to go down, you're going to find out that Mother Nature cannot or does not very often make a 90 degree angle. 
see this plant, and this is this is hard. You can give this to a plant napper today, and I know several plant nappers, and they take this and they whack and they beat and curse and skin knuckles. It's very, very hard to deal with. And you can saw it, you put it in your agate saw and saw it and make slabs out of it and you can do the work. But I also see a whale in this. There's a little brachiopod in there for its eye, and I will pass this around here uh, in, in a few minutes. And I'm also, at this time, I've about finished this book called Sapiens. Now, growing up, watching on TV, see pictures of early man with the big brow, and, and we've been led that, that these were, were just savages. They were not very smart, and and so forth. Well, this book, Sapiens, is really opened my eye. I can't think of the author. Um, right now, I will bring the book next week. He says at this time, during the Paleo time, and the arc and, and the archaic, which is the end of the Paleo time, and, and the beginning of, of, of how our climate changed, that we were at our smartest. That we have been in decline ever since. Well, think about it. Why? Why did he say that? Because you had everyone. Some could do it better than others. I remember a, a story in my reading class that was the boy who shaped stone, which is one of my favorite stories. But you had to be able to take a piece of this flint and break it down. And make you a tool. Everyone had to be able to do that. Everyone had to know which plants you could eat. You had to know the ones you could not eat. You had to know the ones. Everyone had to know everything. You, as we evolved, we specialized. And in this book, it talks specifically about uh, this guy says that we did not domesticate plants. Plants domesticated does when you think about it. The Chinese were the first. There's five things on this earth that we domesticated that caused us not to have to be like the paleo people. The hunters and the gatherers to be able to settle down and go into the agrarian society. The rice was the first one. The Chinese domesticated rice and the pig. That was the start. And you have wheat, corn, barley, and sorghum. Those five things we could we could sustain on if we had to. It's all we would need. Not even sugar. <laughs> but you could take the sorghum, like molasses, or syrup, like the guy does up at Pittsburgh. But in the paleo days, they started out and all they had. Basically, were spear points. There was not a bow and arrow. And this is a, a replica of the, let me pass these around and let you look at it. Um, Mr. Tom Davis owns this point. I had the pleasure of getting to see this point from last Thursday. So you can pass these around and, and look at it. And Hey, Skip, could you mention what the flute is and what it's for? Well, yes, sir. Thank you. The flute, and, and if you watch a modern day flint knapper out do this, there aren't many of them. The flute is where, and this is for, called percussion flaking, where you probably, now this is a deer antler. They would have had a big elk antler. Now, before I do the flute, you have the mastodon or the mammal. You have a giant slaw and you have a giant buffalo. White tailed deer was here, a horse, but it was a small horse that, that completely went extinct, and then the Spanish introduced it. Do you have any at all? Sorry, very little <laughs> more than me, really. But to be able to take this flute, and there are some points with this flute the whole length, and, and no one knows really how they how they did this. If you read um, some of James A. Mitchner's uh, Centennial, they talk about Rattlesnake Butte in there, and that guy, uh, 
taking an antler and, 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 do, and they try to describe how they do that. But that flute was taken out of there. So when you put this on your shaft, it fit tight. Now this is made out of bone. It's made out of the shin bone of a deer. You pass that around. But your paleo people primarily use the spear. So how did you kill a woolly man with a spear? Well, again, they were intelligent people. And even a modern day elephant cannot step up or down over 24 inches. And they had to work in conjunction with each other to be able to drive. Like we know that they used fire. But chances are they had an area with a trench a narrow trench that was at least 24 inches deep. If they drove that beast in that trench, you couldn't get out. You couldn't step out of that. And you couldn't get to them. Now, these were compassionate people. And the reason I say that is because we have found skeletons have been found of paleo people. And one guy was mauled unbelievably. His left eye. His skull was crushed. He had a, a, a severely mangled left arm and a broken leg. And it had healed. So that means that someone, there was enough food to go around, and someone cared enough about this person to where they took care of him and nursed him back to health. You know, with these horrible injuries, you know, I'm a, and, and one of the reasons that they say that, that, that this, uh, the author says that there, were, there wasn't a famine in the sense is because they traveled, they knew where the plums were, they knew where the berries were, and at one particular time of the year, a plant didn't bear, they just ate more of the other. Now, how many in here have not gorged at some point in your life? <laughs> well. That's a natural, that is a natural instinct for human beings because when you were in the hunter gatherer days and you come to a plum tree or a berry tree, you know, all you had with you is what you were carrying. Did you ate, you put all in that you could in your belly because you didn't know what was going to be around the next bend. Uh, you know, these people lived a very idyllic life in a sense. And we, we think, woe is me. Well, they didn't know, you know, they were just to, able to survive. But if you think about taking a woolly man or a mastodon, that was your food, that was that was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That was your food, clothing, and shelter. Just you know, wrapped up. Now, later on. I guess they got tired of carrying these spears. Someone came up with the idea that we can downsize it and, and you can't, if, if you're throwing something with a point this big, it's going to be heavy and it's going to be cumbersome and you're going to have to be close. Well, late paleo, early archaic, and some people want to argue about when these came about. The Atlanta was introduced. Now, there's a guy in Cincinnati, and I can't remember his name. I have it written down at home, but he has a little workshop he calls Arcade Arts. And he, well, I made him boom for it. So the Atlanta came about. These were not called arrows, these were called darts. So someone realized if I can extend my arm out, and I had the pleasure of going to Mr. Tom Davis's last week, as I thought, as I told you, they had some of them had beautiful butterfly shape, some of them were conical, but called banner stones. I mean, these people were artists. They would put on gear. Some people they, had a, they didn't work, they didn't give them anything. Well, they did it, whether it worked or not. So they would put a weight on this. To give you some extra leverage, and this would, would be thrown. Now, 
Now, one theory is, of course, you can't throw this in here, um, <laughs> but you can imagine, I mean, Google Atlantis, they have Atlanta comp uh, competitions. They have Atlantis now made out of aluminum. And, you, and, and people actually hunt rabbits with these things. You hit game on the run. So, one theory is, and again, we don't know this to be sure. And again, you, you were by yourself. You were in a pack, just like wolves. You were hunting, you were hungry. So they would put these darts on the end of this. And I'm going to pass these around here to me. Take a piece of cordage. This is this one is made out of flax. Here is a, a serrated. Again, I will pass these around here in a few minutes. If the, put cordage on this with a loop, and you had to go to the underbelly. Try to throw this in the underbelly. This, this is not pleasant to talk about. It sure wasn't pleasant for the mastodon. But the idea was to puncture the abdominal cavity and with this string trailing. And remember, you got this thing in a trench, so he can't turn on it. The only place, he, the only place he's going to go, this would be trailing. And you want to get this up your, your point. Especially the serrated ones up in the entrails. And then when he starts, this cord would be attached to the dark. And when he steps on this, he's going to throw his guts up. And you ain't going to go far with your guts on that. So then the dinner baby is going around. But again, you know, we don't know for sure, for sure but out west, they have found evidence. Of these heads, of them body cavities, of some mammals. I brought a, a deer antler. They used antlers, the Stone Age is what this was called in, uh, in this book. It's it, the, the Stone Age. I mean, ceaseless coal, hunger, danger. Constant warfare in early days. If you lived to be in your 40s, you were an old person in this day and age. I have a nice deer antler that a car hit the deer in front of me, knocked it off, and I went back to find the other one and couldn't. Here, down the road, I live on 499, right near, right in Great Miami. When I look out my, I set out my house at night. The highest point in Esper County, Peter Mountain, is the top of the kneeling elephant. I think Gary Ballard owns it. Uh, it it's the highest point in Esper County. People say, well, well, how did they know? They knew. They knew what elephants were. They knew what man was. Well, these stories have been passed down. Now, not only did they use the label, that's mature for an older, bigger person. I have one here that's called a youth. And I'll start this right over here with you. Pass around. And they have a smaller one that you used to be. And this is just bean packing. And, and Carl McIntosh, I've taken these to him and he's replicated these. I mean, they're, and I don't know if you ever get the chance or not, but at um, the forestry service that we used to go to, the uh, Living Archaeology Weekend, there was a guy there had one of these, had an Atlanta, a replica that was made out of ivory. <clears throat> that they had found. So we know they've been around that long. So here you had your, your, it's hard for me to see that. And it, this is not fledged. So you had an atlatl 
or even for, for fishing. And I'll take this out and we'll pass that around. Any questions? I'm just. Is this is a tooth or a bone. That's an antler. Deer antler. We have one on Facebook. They wanted to know. They couldn't hear you. What was the highest point in Estill County? In your mouth. Okay. It's over at, um, when you stand at the old Blue Banks Grocery and look out, uh, Gary Ballard lives at the, their station camp, the church, is right at the hind end of the hill. Thank you. It, and it is along the Great Miami. But the Peter Mountain is the highest. Several years ago, they were digging a, a basement right down from my house. And I stopped to see if they didn't find anything. I, I, I knew the, the guy's truck that was there, and they all just kind of got like we are right now. That we were fighting. I said, Well, are you find anything? You find any flint? And one of them scooted the ball across the top, looked up at the top where they were there. And they said, What is that? I said, It's a deer toll. And I'm like, Yeah, we've been finding a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> they didn't know what kind of bone it was. And some people don't. I went, we went to an auction at Maysville one time and we kept going by and looking at this place. And there was a necklace like that was made out of human knuckles. Oh, <laughs> Someone had missed up that that <laughs> big was it, it was. And when someone pointed it out, they left real quick. But does anyone have any questions or comments or? What was the approximate range of, of the atlanta? How, how far could that well, be one accurate? Accurately, only if, if you practice with that, and we're, we're tall and we're long, you would be surprised that, that if I'm talking 100 feet or more, you could, you and I, someone tall like we are, and if you put a banner stone on that, I dare say you could, you could throw that. 200 feet or more. I mean, I've actually seen a competition before guys, they can roll a pipe pan and they can get it, to put an Adelaide dart through a pipe pan and put the back of that wall. Mm -hmm. But it's just like shooting a free throw or anything else. You, don't, you have to practice right. it. And it's very awkward when you start out. But some of the things at, at this basement site that the um, when I pulled in, they were leaving out with a dump truck, and I could see this up in the back of it. And I stopped the guy, I said, where are you going? He said, ah, we got a load of backfield. He'll get those things. I said, if you don't care, get out and roll that stone out the back of that truck for me. I could tell, I just knew by the train or shape of it, we refer to these sometimes, what is lap stones? You could literally, you, you could cross your legs, and when you come up here, you'll see this side is either being in or very near a fire. But this is a nutty stone. And I asked that guy, I said, where did that come out of? Where did you find this? And he said, right in that bank right there. I carried the deer antler with me. So I got over and started digging with the deer antler. And this rolled out. It's a ball of hematite. And I, it started to play. So I... I went home and uh, mixed up some Elmer's glue with water and, and painted it with it so it doesn't play. But, you know, I mean, it fits. And then I got to deep and I dug some more. And lo and behold, this little note. And again, what? And you can train your eye to do this when you're hunting agates. Is when you see something in a creek that's flat like that, chances are Mother Nature didn't do that. And you're going to have some people now, and it can. I'm not going to say it can, but it's highly unlikely because again, there's your nine. Someone squared that off, and you can tell by the way that it's, you know, it's a it's a grinding in stone. There you go, young man. You can hold that. <laughs> and as I said, this this point here with the shin bone, for some reason, the shin bone makes good points and knife handle. Case actually uses the shin bone of a cow out of South America for their knife play. Well, I kept digging. 
and then this popped up. And you can see, I mean, I, and, and it fascinates me just to know that that maybe a paleo person held this at one time. And I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Am, I, am I crazy? No. Yeah. I'm not, but it gives me a special feeling inside for, for me to be able uh, to do this. But you can see the marks on it where it, it's been used. In, and then I dug a little farther. So would you say that they're kind of being used like a mortar and pestle? Well, this was that was their kitchen account. Because the large rock that you passed around, there's a, a specific way I was holding it and it fit perfectly. It fits right in your hand. And these are all of these wheels. I'm gonna have Larry May to search y'all now before we leave. <laughs> 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 Again, this is an ugly. This came out of the creek right below the hog lot that Kendall Arthur found the clothes for me. And I thought I, I stopped and see Kendall. He lived, he still lived at Fitchburg. He took me up there the other day. He said, right here's where I found him. He was 12 years old. He said, I picked it up and he said, it started to grow. We picked them up all the time. He said, I started to sail it toward the creek and I felt it, it felt different. We got to looking at it. And, and then he said, Someone came uh, came by the house and offered us $75 for it. And we knew that it was something special. <laughs> and he never did tell me how much that, that he that he wound up getting for it. But the standard rule today is a thousand dollars an inch. So that highly old. You would say it's pretty much right, John. It's either John Nobles and, and Scott. They so I would say that, that that's not far fetched. You, you know, if you're talking about three and eleven sixteenth, you're talking forty thirty five hundred dollars for that one point, which is why I don't own it. Um, <laughs> no, it's in the it's it has a good home. I don't think it will ever be safe. But if you just look at this, it looks just like a <laughs> just a piece of brown rock laying in the creek. But again, I saw that 90. And if you look at this, and when you, I'm going to pass this one around too. You had to have something heavy because it didn't take these paleo people long to figure out. Because I go pick berries all day, or I scrounge around in that creek, crawdads and mussel shells or whatever. I can kill that outfit right there and throw his bone on the floor and crack it and take that bar out of there. And that's about four days worth of scratching in the ground for hickory nuts. So they knew. I mean, they were. But, and this would be a hard piece to work, but if you look, it, it has actually been played. And before I played all this, I've let several people look at this and they agreed with it. But, but when you put your hand on this, four hands, now these people were not big. They were they were closer to what our Indians are because they lived in a cold climate. They were shorter and you know, <clears throat> just not big and, and, and tall like like we are. They didn't have the food sources, you know. Uh, but I believe in my heart and soul that this is a, a, a tool. And feel free to, to disagree. And I did not realize until studying the paleo, they would even work. This is a flake. And when I pass this around, if you it's serrated, if you run, you, you could you could skin something with this today, or you could you, you could cut your steak at dinner with this in, in this day and age. And, and, and I found this, it came out of the uh, Fitchburg Creek. Here's a little, I think this is a little pastel in, in again. People talk about my middle state sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you look at this real close. I think it resembles a whale. If, when, you, when I pass this around and you look at it, and you look in its eye, or do you, you know what a brachiopod is? Like a, 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 an oyster is a brachiopod. I'll give you the definition. 
a brachiopod, any of various marine invertebrates of the phylum Brachiopodia, having bivalve dorsal and ventral shells, enclosing a pair of tentacles, arm like structures that are used to sweep minute food particles into the mouth. The state fossil of Kentucky. An oyster is a brachiopod. And you find these shells, but if you look real close, that eye, you will see a little brachiopod. Yeah. It is. And here is another piece that has a big old flute knocked out of it. And it too came where I, I found both of these pieces, all three of them, the big piece and that piece and this piece on the same rock bar within an area, which makes me think that I'm close. And and again, I thought about one of these creeks. I always ask uh, permission before I go. And Mr. Beckley up at, at Pittsburgh, if you'll stop and ask him, he never that I know has ever told anyone no. Uh, but I go up. I help take care of the Pittsburgh furnace, and I sometimes if I have a, an hour or so, then I hit the creek and, and, and hunt. But this was was probably a scraper, and. And, and like Christina said, if you move these things around, you you find a way that they fit in your hand. It's, there's your another one. God, is it okay to I see your top lids on uh, one of my four students? <laughs> Oh, we, we, <laughs> we had a good It's like being married sometimes. We've had a tumultuous relationship, but it's worked out. I'm proud of God. He, uh, my relationship with him, I met him in the school system, and, and, and we kind of barked at each other every now and then. We were never disrespectful, and, but he, he went on and, and and become a veteran, and I'm, and I'm proud of being part of his life. And and I, I knew that he was into this, and, and I called him. And he, these are are paleo era points that he's brought. He's going to be here next week, dressed in uh, pioneer attire. So we're, we're going to move out of the uh, the paleo and into the arcade period next week, to where the Europeans get here. So he's going to be a long hunter. Uh, here next week. Now this center piece what, is that a gorgon? We would has a hole drilled in it. How did they drill holes? How do you think they would drill a hole? Bow drill. A bow drill. There, there's one at Glade Creek. That bow drill, sand, and cane. Some of them would do it by hand or with the bow. So, it, but what does this, this tell you? If, if they had that gorge, it was fashion. It wasn't a necessity. And when you see things, that was that was a piece of their jewelry, maybe ceremonial, which means that these people had time to to be in the arts, and they had some leisure time. You know, it wasn't all. Ceaseless toll. For the most part, it was, but in, in different segments of it. And a minute ago, we mentioned constant war. Now, they fought over hunting ground, just like Kentucky. What, what's our, what do we call Kentucky? Dark and bloody ground. And, and there's a reason for that. And no one really knows. Where that came from, we, we've had different people, but and we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But when you think about it, the Cherokee sold Kentucky because they were mad at the Shawnee. The Shawnee had run them off. So at Sycamore Shoals, you had some rich white guys that hired Daniel Boone, but. We think this is where the, the, the same dark and bloody ground came from. There was a chief 
named Dragon Canoe, who was bitterly opposed. He was, if you ask a Native American, do you want to sell this land? They would say, I don't own this land, which is what we wanted to hear. And if you don't own it, who does? Well, they looked at it, no one. The earth is my mother. They would even, at, at, at times, would, would have a ceremony before they would dig a hole in the ground because the earth was their mother. Now, they were rough on the land. They used fire, just like we do. But they were different in a way. So we're going to move from out of the dark age. Um, next week, we will, we will go to the archaic. The bow and arrow comes in. They, they do away. You know, someone was smart enough to figure out, you know, this is, you know, to do a bow. And to get down to the, you know, John was talking about, you know, when I would go hunt, I live, I live over on Wiseman County. If you go down to Station Camp, which we're going to talk exclusively about next week, which was named by Daniel Boone, there's an area up there that's not much bigger than the hood of the car. But I would take two buckets. I'd take, you know, I'd take four or five buckets. I'd line them, I'd put a bucket down here. And I'd go off a couple hundred feet, and I'd put another bucket, and I'd take me a nail agent. You know, if I was going back to the same place year after year, I, I did it to the, they started no-till farming. You know, I was talking to John. We, he's, we, we've got a guy that's going, maybe be going to plow some this year. But I would take that nail apron, and I would go through there, and every piece of plant I came to, I picked up. Because I knew I was going to come back and hunt that place again. I just didn't want to throw them down. Then I'd go home and I'd take that bucket, put me a tarp out, fill that bucket full of water, and start going through it. And I have found points like you were talking about. They're the size of your little fingernail. And had I not done that, you know, I, I wouldn't have found those. But those are your true, what we call bird points. Or that'd be the point they shot you with. You know, they couldn't be big due to, due to the air and so forth. Here, with an atlanta, a little bit of weight helps. Now, I had, we actually made some shafts at one time, and I, well, I've had several students in my life. You know, you can't teach anyone, someone something that knows more than you do. <laughs> And they did not want to believe that you got to put the big in first. When you're making this shaft, it won't fly if you put the little in. It'll turn around. If you get in the canoe, of course, I'm using the big guy and I'm in the back. If you don't paddle, that canoe, if you just sit there, the heaviest, ever who the heaviest, the heaviest person sitting in the back, and you're in the current. That canoe is going to slowly turn around, and that heavy person is going to be. That's just the way it is. It's aerodynamics, the, the, the fluid of the situation. It took me a while to make them under, well, after they, they made the first shaft and tried to throw it, it wouldn't go because it was trying to turn over in air and make the big end go first. And they realized, and, you know, and, and if we sat down to do one of these for the first time, your first thought was, I want the little end. I want it to look like an airplane, you know. But it's, you know, with the little end first on one of these, it, it is an aerodynamic. Now, here is a, another piece that I have been, well, I actually had a guy look at it. I wouldn't pay $25 to send me a piece of paper to read it. Um, but this is a very special. Piece. This is a paleo knife. This probably had a half on it at one time. And I'm going to pass this around. It's a very, very unique piece. This came out of Clark County near the Red River. Any questions? Don't want to start your other <coughs> piece around. And, and I'm going to pass your 
your deer skin around too. And again, the, the is that a is that that is a deer skin? Or? Yeah, that's just a piece of lumber. Okay. <laughs> Now, something about this is a, a piece of buck skin. We're going to get our head of repel a little bit. Why is a buck called a buck? Why is a dollar called a buck? Because your average deer. Uh, was worth a dollar. They were worth 40 cents a pound. And the average height, when the hair was taken off of it, and it was straight, like two and a half pounds. Hence, your dog. But this has been tanned, it's, it's soft, it's supple. Now, I can't imagine having to skin an, an elephant. But, you know, but it, it's just like we make jokes sometimes how to use an elephant. What about it in time? But that's what they did. But they were. And the reason we know this is, is I can't, it's maybe in Wisconsin, there's a museum out there that they found a butcher's knife. They just about literally built the museum around that, where the skeletons are still there and the, the cut marks are in. But you think of this I mean, no metal, no plastic, no, no bucket. You know, every, everything had to be made out of wood, bone, or stone. Were these found in this one? These, where were these found, Scott? These are, are were, from this. They were found in a region. Uh, you're talking Clark County, Powell County, Bristol, mostly. Part of the Tamport is found, clearly, but they were all found here. But these people were just like us. No, today, if if they were here today, they would fit right in with us. They may look different, but um, but we have the same genetic, the DNA. Um, you know, they would be one of us. Uh, you know, they weren't that different. Just a, just a different uh, time frame. What what's that time frame skip? What are we talking about? For the paleos. And I mentioned, I should have got this little book out. And I've taken a lot of this information. I was a, again, I don't mean to, to slam, but um, I was an ant, uh, uh, archaeology and anthropology and, and teaching. And, and this is a, was a, 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 I have one of these for every one of my students, it's a prehistoric hunter in Heather, Kentucky's first pioneer. And it has a little timeline in it. Your early paleo would be, and, and again, this can change. 11,500 years ago, 10,800 years ago, middle paleo, uh, 10, 8 to 10, 5, and then your late paleo would be up to 10,000 years ago. But they found a Clovis point down in Chile. And the reason they're called uh, Clovis points is the first one was found in Clovis, New Mexico. And it was dated, the, the radiocarbon uh, materials around it was dated uh, to be 6,000 years old. And then later on, they found one uh, farther south that dated 12,000 years old. So I don't think we really know. I, I think, you know, it's just a long time ago. My personal opinion, I think these people were here longer than we think, and I think they were here before we give them credit. And in, in, in all of my education and so forth, they, they talk about the first people came across the Bering Sea, the Bering Strait, because during the Ice Age, they said that the oceans dropped 300 feet. Well, you, you think about, you know, um, but why have they found the closest point in that area? And the only place that they found closest points are, are like in New Mexico and in Kentucky. There's a, and, and this is a big debate among your archaeologists. 
is if, if these people came in here that early and were using these clovis points, then why haven't we found one somewhere else? And no one can answer that. Maybe we had some expert workmanship here. I, I don't know, but why hasn't one been found? You know, we've been taught the, the leakies, Old Bay Gorge, where the people came out of, you know, your early National Geographic. But the only place these Clovis points have been found are in here in North America, which is, you know, open for debate. Um, the early archaic people started coming in about 8,000 years ago. And those, your, your archaic people, your paleo people have evolved through time down to be up what we know as our modern Native Americans. And, and if you read, I mean, you, you know, your Shawnee, your, your Cherokee, the Iroquois, the Chickasaws, you know, they all had different dialects and, and so forth. You know, it's, it's just very interesting and it's, you know, we can debate you know, a, a lot. Well, it's almost, what is it? It's about six or seven minutes till. Does anyone have a question or a comment or? Yes. I read about the first people being called Fort Ancient, but I couldn't find any more information. Do you have? Well, and your, your Fort Ancient people, <laughs> they came, your Fort Ancients come on up in the arcade. Up in the later archaic, and they're they're more refined. They have pottery. Um, did, did you Google that? And have you Google Fort Ancient? No, institutions such as universities are having to get recognition yes. to to indigenous people, and so EKU refers to Fort Ancient. Well, they found a Fort Ancient camp when they put under sewer plant. You have to now you have to go in, do a dig after there are any graves there. And I agree with that. You know, um, I've been possible to you know, being a digger and, and, a, and a looter, and, which I am I'm not. I, you know, I don't want somebody up over me to my dad. And uh, I'm not going to be somewhere else. And what, what do you say about the poor names? Do you think it was in the art? I think they were the last Indian here. They, they were. Yeah, we found uh, a lot on Kentucky River. Really? Uh, I mean, I know for that. Well, did you know John Martin? Mm -hmm. uh, me, 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 me. But the Fort Ancient, like, like Anthony says, it's the late, late arcade, but they, they were, your quote, modern. They had, they had metal. The, the, the Europeans that had got here to them, um, they had metal knives uh, a lot of times. They used flint uh, too, but they would be more of our, our modern. The bow, they used the bow and arrow. They had pottery. They they stayed in one place long. Uh, the three sisters, four beans and squash, they fought. So they were not complete nomads. You know, they didn't they didn't jump up. They would stay <laughs> probably left the winter bodies of a very cold bitter and went to the rock shelters up in the mountains. Um, but you're basically they they would be your what we consider modern in a sense. Anyone else have a question? Or? Yes, comment. Yeah, yes. you talked about uh, I used to teach, you know, earth science. Yes. I teach rock and everything. We do a rock place with my students. And what you said is right. I don't know how many times that students bring in a rock. I remember an Ashcraft girl one time. She lived on top of Fifth and yes. And she brought me a, a breaking pot. Like you said, she found the thing. She said, well, what is it? Hey, how, how did they get up here? I'm same way. And it explains it's a sea way. creature. Yeah. They want to yeah. No, there's no way. Yeah, there's I know. No way. She found it right on top of Fifth and Ridge. You know, and, and as I said, I live on 499 at a place that the grocery store where the Gene Arvin run was called Blue Banks. Right. Well, the reason it's called Blue Banks is I live in it. it it's clay and it's blue from a mineral called glauconite. That was an ancient sea base. Yeah. 
That's where your ag is going to come into play. Fairly interesting. And a lot of you, and again, a lot of your ag is from seed trees. They were bragging good pond, you were kids with pool. Who else has a question? Anyone else? We have one on the computer, but I was going to tell you to well, try to stay a little bit closer so everybody can okay. hear you. Okay. I know you like to move around, but I, like I think we'll try to get a wireless mic next time. Um, they asked, what was the, di the distance the group could move if needed to relocate? Oh, and miles. They knew every stream. They knew where every bush was, but you had to be careful not to move into someone else's territory. You know, they knew, like, um, well, uh, that home route, Louisiana, how did it get its name? Red stick. Red stick. Someone found a red baton stuck in the ground that was a mark. Paint lick, Kentucky. Same thing. Had paint on a stick stuck down by the lid to say, this is my lid. Don't you come around here. Mm -hmm. We may eat you for something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't know, but you know, we're, we're not going to get into that gruesome category tonight, but it did happen. Um, they had markers that they knew, but they would range, you know, just they were asking Daniel Boone. Um, well, I'm somewhere there with Doug and they were talking about some guy said, uh, well, why do they call this place Plum Lick? Said there ain't a plum tree around here, or, or there's no, there's not, there in the lick here. He said, that's where we stopped and eat the plums. We gathered in our hat from Plum Lick, <laughs> from the lick up the, up the, the street. Sweet Lick Knob down here, Estes Springs. That was your first fast food. If you wanted something to eat and there was a trail wider than this room to it, it was a, you know, there was almost two acres like, <laughs> that were wallowed down. That water has iron, it's cleavage water, iron, sulfur, and salt. Stamping ground. That's stamping ground, you would say. The buffalo. There was a salt spring there, and the buffalo went and stood in line and stomped the ground. <laughs> Probably put one out of the way at times. You know, and, and to me, this is social studies, and that you know, and I enjoy teaching this. And if if you if you'll start peeling back the layers, you know, one of the first things I would try to tell my students is you can't help where you live, what your last name is. You know. And, and then, you know, anyone in here know where Fighting Branch was? Yeah. 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 Your grandpa lived on the back side or the front side, depending on which way you went. You know, my aunt lived right in the middle of it. It's called Fighting Branch for a reason. You know, but P. Reeves, they didn't, some of them didn't want to say they lived on P. Reeves because they were going to be made fun of. But when they found out that it came from a cow pee, not somebody peeing over the ridge. <laughs> it changed around a little bit. Where did they live? Um, you, you know, Crooked Creek. What is it? Crooked Creek. Clear Creek. Dickie Ford. Well, someone went in there and come out covered in ticks at one time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Big Go Creek and Little Go Creek. You know, these names have a have a meaning. But I'm going to leave this stuff out. It's 7 o'clock. I'm a former crew officer, and I believe it's starting and ending on time. <laughs> but thank you for coming tonight. I've enjoyed this. I said, if you got blitz on I will be here next week, same time, same station. I hope.